you know, and, and often people are, you know, say, oh, well, um, they've stolen our jobs. And the assumption is, is that if they didn't steal your job, you would get that job back or you would want that job, <laughs> which is another question. Are foreigners being unfairly scapegoated by South Africans? This is a question that I posed to author and entrepreneur Gigi Alcock in a recent episode of my podcast. What follows is a short extract from a longer conversation. You can watch the full length discussion by clicking on the link in the description below. Enjoy. We're seeing a lot of community groups, civil society actors, particularly in rural towns coming together to fix uh, municipal sewage works or to fill potholes, for example. Uh, are there kind of collective mechanisms whereby some of these traders in Ikasi can kind of come together and start to improve the, the operating environment themselves, filling the potholes and, uh, you know, facilitating access to, uh, you know, uh, transport or electricity or what have you? I think it's much more limited in the sense that many of, the, you know, the whole, I guess, um, uh, one of the issues with the sector is in essence, it's non-networked, you know, they, they very rarely have associations. I mean, we're not talking now the taxi industry, yeah. but, you know, most of the other guys would not really have an organized business forum, as an example. Um, and um, you will have residence associations, which do do this kind of thing. But um, from a business perspective, much, much less organized. Um, and those who are organized are often like a hawker association, uh, we're off. I mean, the Hawker Association in in downtown Joburg took the city of Joburg to court and managed to stop them from evicting them from the street. So, you know, that's a good example. They they raised enough money and 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 were organised enough to to take the city to a high court. Um, there are incidences, but it's not hugely widespread because uh, it is generally still a fairly I mean, the word independent trade, as I mentioned, is to a large extent the fact that that they're often not not uh, networked and organized. Uh, and, and it's probably a weakness of that sector. Um, if you look at the Somali and Ethiopian traders in the Spaza sector, they've been much, much more organized and hence the ability to really dominate that sector, whereas the South African Spaza owner doesn't really work with a guy down the road or, or and so on. So... I'd say it's a weakness of that space. That's one of them. And, you know, you often see uh, people complaining that oh, these foreign spaza shop owners are driving mm -hmm. us out of business. I remember once hearing uh, on the radio somebody calling in and saying, you know, it's not fair because I open my spaza shop at 6 a.m., but these Somalis, they open theirs at 5 a.m. And they, you know, all of the customers yeah. are going to them. And I thought, well, why don't you open yours at 5 a.m. as well and compete? You know, that's the market. Yeah. Um, so do you Look, think that there's kind of scapegoating happening with, with immigrants? Yeah, there is a lot of scapegoating happening. And and I mean, I say you've got to look at both sides of the coin. First of all, the South African Spaza owner couldn't compete with ShopRite, Pick and Pay, and so on when they entered the township economy. So the Somalis arrived long after the South African had been pushed out of that space. And the Somali was able to much more competitively compete with uh, ShopRite and Pick and Pay and so on on price, on service, they offer credits to the social grant recipients with no interest and so on. But one of the things you've got to take into account, so there's 25 billion rand a year paid by the Spaza sector to South African households. And often that's not measured, you know, between seven and a half thousand rand up can be paid by a relatively medium sized Spaza shop to the South African homeowner, because they don't own the property, they're renting from a South African. So are we counting that 25 billion rand a year? Even if you want to argue with me and say it's less, it's still going to be a couple of billion rand a year that's being earned by South Africans. Um, and um, in rental, so that's a passive um, income that they're receiving. Uh, and there's other things, you know, do, uh, they, they provide um, products, the same branded products at the same price as a shop right within walking distance. So, you know, households can spend up to 10% of their, uh, of their total budget on public transport going to um, uh, stock up. Now they're able to walk to this, you know, Somali Spaza a couple of hundred meters away. Um, and, and, you know, so, so there's a saving for many people 
of that. So there's a number of benefits. In many cases, they will employ a South African. The larger stores will employ you know, a couple of South Africans, even if it's for security, because they know the South Africans won't take rubbish from other South Africans. You know, so you have got to lend, you know, put some some perspective on it. The other thing about it is that you can't say they're illegal immigrants. Some of them are, many of them, the majority are probably illegal, but a large number of the Ethiopians and Somalis will have a non-resident ID. They will have a driver's license. The larger stores will even be registered for VAT and so on. So, I think we have to be careful when we look at it um, in terms of. What is the equation? You know, what's the balance in terms of what they do versus what they don't do? And I think it's it's a terribly simplistic, and it has been proven wrong to to show to say that the foreigners have stolen South Africans' jobs and they dominate in this informal economy. At best, they dominate in the spaza sector. But if you look at it across the total informal economy, if that's what you want to call it. They're only in certain sectors. They're not in the alcohol sector. It's a 110 billion rand sector. They're not in the fast food sector, another 90 billion sector. They're not in the taxi sector, 50 billion. They're not in the hair care sector, largely 10 billion. You know what I'm saying? And they're not in the Muti sector. So, so when we say the Somalis are stolen our jobs, I should rather say the Somalis took our spaza shops that we'd closed down over uh, and are now paying us rent. And then does that suddenly change what the the, the optics are, you know? And saving us money when we go and actually buy goods from those spas shops. Hundred percent. And I've often said to you know, um, one of the politicians um, uh, asked me about this, and I was like, okay, so the assumption you make is that if you got rid of all the Somalis and Ethiopians and Bangladeshis in the country, a South African would take their job immediately, and that's not true. It wouldn't happen. In fact, all you would do is that you would be enabling the the formal retailers to make a hell of a lot more money. Um, and uh, the South African wouldn't take over the job. The South African wasn't able to. And also the South Africans prefer other business sectors, which are higher margin, easier sectors, uh, like the fast food sector and the alcohol sector, much higher margin, and in some ways a lot easier kind of businesses to retail uh, or FMCG, dry goods retail, uh, and and so on. So, so South Africans wouldn't enter that sector, but... Um, you know, and, and often people are, you know, say, oh, well, um, they've stolen our jobs. And the assumption is, is that if they didn't steal your job, you would get that job back or you would want that job, <laughs> which is another question. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this discussion, you might want to check out the full length interview with Gigi Alcock. That's linked over here. You can also subscribe to my other channel. That's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.